Well, hello everyone and welcome to another in Instructional Design and Learning SIG webinar. Today we are lucky to have Ali Prof as our speaker. She's going to tell us about remembering forward. She's going to give us some tips and tricks for how to get people to actually, actually remember the instructional content that you give them. And oh, I think we've First, got to know Allie at the summit this year. She was a very popular speaker. Um, and then I um, listened to her podcast that she made with Ed Marsh, and that was fabulous. Then the next thing that I saw from Allie was some notebook posts. So Allie's got um, audio content out there, and um, Allie's got some written content out there, and today we're going to make some video content out there. So. Let's everybody put their hands together uh, for Allie Poff. Virtually, of course. Thank you so Virtually. much. <laughs> I'm so greetings. I'm really excited to be here. Um, I I just find it really fascinating. Um, I I find these things and then I just want to share them with people. So it's just kind of like you know when you get excited about something you're like hey did you see this new cool thing so um, my new cool thing today I'm calling it remembering forward using emotion and storytelling to increase learning retention and um, before I get into like my picture in my bio just a little bit of history about how I got here is that um, I used to be like very separate like I love math and science and I love reading and writing, but they were very separate things for me. Um, and one of the reasons why I went into technical communication and technical writing is that I was very uncomfortable with fiction writing because when you write down somebody's story, like it's very personal. And so when I would get feedback, um, editing feedback, it was kind of hard to take. Whereas if I got editing feedback on a series of instructions or you know, step one, step two, step three, that was very factual, very logical, and it was much easier to take feedback. And over the last, I would say, four years, I've discovered the power of storytelling in all these other fields. Like, you know, marketing and sales have always had storytelling as one of their buzzwords. We've got data analytics and, you know, the data storytelling, and it really is powerful. Um, so one of the things that I'm trying to do after like 10 or 15 years of training myself out of using storytelling and technical writing is now how do I incorporate storytelling and technical writing? One of the things that kind of sets us apart in this new social media age is the ability to connect with people. Like when, when I was growing up, and I'll date myself a little bit, there weren't computers yet. Um, so like you go to the library and there's just the card catalog. And then the internet came along, it's like, wow. And all this information went onto the web and then it was this explosion of information at your fingertips. And now that we have all this information, it's not necessarily about the information, it's about the connections that you make with your user. So that's why uh, emotion and storytelling are how I'm I'm kind of like focusing anything that I talk about. I'm trying to stay focused in that general area. So a little bit about me. There we go. I am currently at Acrolinks. I just joined Acrolinks in September. If you're curious about them, you can look them up on the web. Um, it's a really cool company and I really believe in their their mission and the people are nice to work with. My job is project management and training, professional services. For the past 12 years before that, I was at Boeing doing technical writing and knowledge management. And then before that, I had a year teaching high school math and I was briefly a communications officer in the US Navy. Um, like I said, my interests are emotive analytics and technical storytelling, and emotive analytics basically is the ability, so right now a lot of the analytics that we're measuring, such as time on page or page bounce, they have to, they deal with a user's behavior, whereas emotive analytics tries to get to the why, kind of like Simon Sinek says, start, start with why. And so trying to measure a person's feelings 
by their face, by their voice, by other biometric things that you might be wearing if you're wearing a Fitbit, and trying to adjust your content based on somebody's feelings. And it also makes it more effective, and it also connects more with them. Um, I have started a blog called Technically Eclectic. Um, my posts are not regular yet, but my New Year's resolution, I'm starting early, my New Year's resolution is to post at least twice a month, maybe weekly. Um, and you can also find me on Twitter at Technic Eclectic. I also have an at Prof account, but I mostly use uh, the at Prof for personal stuff and at Technic Eclectic for tech comm stuff. Hmm. There we go. All right, so who is this training for? Are you in the right place? So I've designed today's talk to be for people who are instructional designers, because this is the Instructional Design and Learning Special Interest Group. Thank you. Um, yay! <laughs> I thought it might help to match up my uh, audience with my host. Um, also, I want to include just general technical content creators because this is the Society for Technical Communication. And basically, and this is a horrible sentence grammatically if I were to unbulletize it, but I'm going to do it anyways. This is for anybody who's in a situation where you are explaining or transmitting information to an audience or a user who needs to learn or remember something to accomplish a task after training is complete or the words are read. That's kind of a long sentence, but it'll make sense as we go uh, as we go along. Hmm. There we go. All right. So what are the things that I want to talk about today? And kind of doing this so you can decide if you want to leave early or hopefully stay for the whole thing. But um, this past summer, I was reading a book called Impossible to Ignore, Creating Memorable Content to Influence Decisions by Carmen Simon. And it was something that really excited me. I'm like, oh my gosh, this it's, it's not necessarily groundbreaking information, but it it's some... My, my hope is that after this presentation, you'll have some time to reflect on these ideas and how they might affect your work. Um, and a full disclaimer, sometimes I get so caught up in getting my job done, like I go to work, I'm sitting at my desk, I've got a, a job to do, and sometimes the routine of what I do helps, I just kind of get comfortable. And it's really useful to just like, you know, pick up Strunk and White's Elements of Style or um, just review some best practices. They don't have to be, um, you know, Einstein's theory of relativity. It just inspires me. It reminds me why I do what I do and it just helps me refocus. And like I uh, shared before, uh, my, my favorite soapbox topics and the central theme to anything I try to speak to or write about is for content to be effective, it must affect people's emotions. And also learning is more effective when you affect people's emotions. And the best way to affect emotions is through storytelling, even in technical content. So we're going to pretend for a moment. Let's say you're sitting at your desk preparing to create some training or other technical content. Um, no one I know actually has a desk like this, but while we're pretending, we might as well just kind of pretend we have a desk like this. And let's pretend you've been asked to create some training or other content on a new feature. And I'm going to make this very generic, so hopefully everybody can relate. What goes through your mind? And um, we can either you can think think to it in yourself. You can, um, if you want to write an answer and share in the chat box, you're welcome to do that. We are being recorded, but you're also welcome to unmute yourself and speak if you'd like. And if nobody wants to chat, then I have some answers that I can share. Any 
In fact, um, if you if somebody does want to chat, feel free to. I'm going to share my answers while you're thinking about it, and if not, that's okay too. So some of the things that often goes through an instructional designer's mind is, you know, everybody knows about Addy, um, analysis, design, des development, implementation, and evaluation, A-D-D-I-E. So basically, those are the objectives. What am I teaching? Okay, so I've got this new feature. What, what are the things that I need to teach? What are the key understandings? What are the tasks? What are the skills? What methods will I use to convey this? Um, what are the assessments? How will I measure if my learning is effective or not? Um, yay, Jamie's like, what does the learner already know? Um, I might even consider my user personas, like who am I talking to? Um, <laughs> I also might have some other distracting thoughts, like, man, I only have one hour to do three hours of work, or, you know, I wonder what I'm going to cook for dinner tonight when I come home. So other things come into my mind while I'm trying to create my topic. Um, and this is where I, you know, I start getting comfortable and in, is that most of the time when I create training, I'm creating training for the sake of the knowledge that I think that the person needs to know, or maybe you're creating training that you're required to share for legal purposes, like ethics training or um, HR training. Other times, the training I'm creating is a list of tasks or objectives that the user needs to be able to do. So these are the things that I'm thinking about while I'm sitting at my desk saying, okay, I got an hour to create this training. What am I going to do? But there might be some things missing. Um, at the STC Summit this past spring, and I will uh, coordinate with Vicki to send out my PowerPoint, I have uh, links in the, uh, in the notes section. But Kirk St. Amant spoke at STC Summit last spring about um, his title was Prototypes of Use and Adapting Content and Its Usability. Basically, um, it's considering your user and not only what they need to know, but where they might be doing it. He pointed out that so much documentation is written by people in offices who sometimes forget or else don't even know what the conditions are like for the end user. And when I was at Boeing, the mechanics and the people out in the factory would often complain that the engineers wouldn't even consider like what they were doing um, you know, and the conditions that they had to work in. And sometimes, like flight attendants, you know, the engineers would design a seat here or a phone there, and then they would get complaints back saying, I'm a flight attendant and I'm trying to sit in this seat and I can't reach the phone when I'm seat belted in for takeoff or landing. And they were like, oh, I didn't even think about that. So for, for those of us who are writing training, are the people taking your training in a loud factory? Are they out on the out in the field? Are they maintain, maintenance people? Um, if you create a webinar, someone can watch it anytime. Are they watching in a group setting or an individual setting? Um, are they able to listen with speakers or without speakers? Is the training available to people at home where they might be a little bit more distracted? Um, or do they have to be in the office where they also might be distracted by people dropping by their desk? Um, I was at Costco the other day and I saw some vehicle emergency kits, which is what reminded me of Kirk St. Amant's training. One of the things I saw at Costco were vehicle emergency kits. And I was thinking about, you know, one of the things that Kirk brought up is that, um, people were writing instructions for these car like maintenance manuals and the people who were using them sometimes had to when the car would break down it would be dark at night it would be raining it would be really cold and wet and crappy so i was thinking as i saw as i was looking at these kits you know what if you know, I wonder what kind of paper they're using. Is it regular paper or is it laminated card? Is it a book with small numbers 
um, with, with small numbers or print, or is it large enough text and diagrams to be seen in poor visibility? Um, another example is a little over five years ago, infant and child um, pain reliever came in two different concentration, concentrations or strengths. And pediatricians saw so much misdosing that uh, they eventually recommended that the ibuprofen manufacturers go with just one standard concentration of ibuprofen. And for those of you who might have cared for children or um, infants, you know, not even as a parent, but as like an aunt or uncle or a babysitter. I just want you to think for a moment, what's the typical situation when you give child a pain reliever? It's not necessarily you're like sitting, smiling like an ad with a kid sitting on the, you know, bathroom counter going, oh, let's take the ibuprofen now. Oftentimes it's in the middle of the night, you're tired, you're blurry, it's dark, the child is in distress, they're crying, you're stressed out, they're stressed out, and it's really hard to be like, oh, did I grab the lower concentration or the higher concentration? How much does my child weigh or you know, does it matter more how much they weigh or how, much, or how old they are? So these are things that oftentimes we can consider, um, but the real, the real point for today is not just considering the physical location of where your user might be, but the temporal aspect of when the user is both learning the content and when the user will need to pull that content out of their memory and act upon the content, um, hence the title Remembering Forward. Our audiences listen to us and they may agree that what we say is helpful. When they leave, they might still remember something from what we had said, but maybe they don't do anything about it. And we can change that, uh, we can address that by changing our approach to how we view memory. And um, I have, I'll get to some specific applications in a bit, as well as some ways I've changed my thinking as I approach training that I'm creating right now in my new position. Hello? I hear you. Okay. <laughs> I just yeah. glanced at the chat. I was looking over at my notes and I was just like, oh, I lost audio. Okay. I'm glad that I'm still connected. Yeah, it does look like a couple of us have bounced offline, but it looks like she's back online. So. Okay. Oh, Thank you. So here's Here's a simple statement that's deeper than it seems. People act on what they remember, not on what they forget. And what we have to do is we have to realize that if, like, I'm realizing that in this time that we are spending together, I'm going to share a number of things with you, and you're not going to remember 100% of everything. Um, you're going to have some key takeaways, and hopefully I've designed my presentation well enough that the key takeaways you take away are the same key takeaways that I want you to take away, and the rest are kind of just um, fillers and bridges that help support the information so that you can have that key takeaway. Um, Recent studies are showing the importance of memory and the ability to make decisions. When we want to be a part of people's actions and decisions, what we don't realize is that we're asking what the future will bring. So for instance, when you woke up this morning, you were predicting the future, whether you realized it or not. How did you decide what to wear? Were you thinking about the weather? Were you thinking about any uh, meetings you had? Like, oh, I need to dress up for this meeting. Or, hey, I'm going into this part of the office and I'm just gonna dress, dress casual today. Or maybe um, you were thinking about things that you had to do after work on your way home. Like, okay, I'm gonna go by my, um, and have dinner with somebody after work, go out for some drinks, and then I want to wear this outfit for somebody after drinks. Um, you know, maybe you didn't put a lot of thought into your clothes, that's okay. But you might have also um, 
thought about lunch. Are you bringing your lunch or are you buying lunch? So you're, you're kind of creating a prediction about the future and then you're planning for that future. The same thing with um, if you drove to work or anytime you drive anywhere or not even drive, take the bus. What route do you take to get to your destination? What future are you or your traffic app predicting that decides, do I go left and then right or right and then left? Do you even trust your traffic app? Like your traffic app might say, oh, you should take this alternate route. And you're like, nah, I don't believe you. I'm just going to go this way. So as trainers, we must be able to expect what will happen in our user's future in order to influence that person's decisions or actions. We'll get into this more, but this is where I get drawn into my soapbox. Um, like I you know, said before, the most efficient way to somebody's memory is through emotion. The most efficient way to affect somebody's emotion is through stories. Stories engage more areas of the brain than facts or knowledge. And stories don't have to be elaborate. One of the Twitter accounts that I follow and sometimes retweet are whole stories that can be in, well, previously 140 characters or less. And it's really amazing just how short some of the stories are. And sometimes you don't even have to have a whole story, but you can use narrative techniques to create vivid visual detail um, or you know, kind of set a scene or set a situation. Oftentimes when we do training, we'll be like, imagine, you know, you are learning to use SharePoint and you are an organizer for a party company and you need to be able to create a list of addresses. So there we just set a situation, we use narrative techniques to create a story. Um, I would I don't have any studies to back up this statement, but if you were to just, if I were to just list facts, um, my presentation would not be as interesting and it wouldn't be as memorable and you wouldn't learn as well. And the whole idea of predicting the future comes to what happens next. Our brains are constantly thinking and analyzing what we need to do. Our survival has depended on our ability to accurately predict the outcome of our decision. To make the wrong decision can make, even today, it's not just like caveman days, but even today, to make the wrong decision, you can potentially die. Um, like if you're driving down the road and then like a deer jumps out on the road in front of you, like if you've trained yourself well and you've rehearsed it, like you've anticipated that future, I know when I was learning to drive, my dad would constantly be like, uh, as we we're driving down the street, okay, pretend a kid jumps out in front of you. Okay, pretend that car on the left just ran a red light. Like, and so he would kind of help me think about possible emergencies that I might face as a driver so that that way I could predict the future. And then if that future ever came to pass, I would be able to potentially save my life. The question is, how do our brains get the information to predict the future? And the answer is memory. Again, why I say remembering forward. Um, in the book, uh, Carmen shares the story of ultra runner Killian Jornet Bergada, who ran, this is pretty amazing, who ran up Mount McKinley, paused for 10 minutes at the summit, then ran back down. He did the whole thing in 11 hours and 48 minutes, where the average mountain climber takes two weeks to climb Mount McKinley. So he's one of those ultra runners. Um, and I didn't want to copy her book too much. I wanted to respect copyright. So instead, we'll talk about the, the jumper in this picture. Yeah, what's going to happen to him? <laughs> what's going to happen to him? I'm scared for him. So... <laughs> Yay! And actually, I was looking at this because I'm, you know, trying to think about my audience and, you know, men versus women. And, you know, I was like, I wonder if, you know, just looking at it, I wonder if that's a man or a woman. It could be probably a man. But anyways, the more important thing is that um, after this jumper reaches the bottom safely, I assume, 
Um, if you were to put this person in an MRI machine and interview them about past experiences, then ask them about their plans for future experiences, many of the same areas of the brain would light up in both remembering past events as well as planning future events. So um, areas of the brain that have to do with vivid imagery, so things like seeing the sun rising, seeing the snow, breathing cold air, contextual information, such as the background of the trip, how did you get there, where is this jump taking place, the physical location. Um, facts, details about who was with you, how high did you climb, what time of day it was. Um, concept conceptual information, um, so concepts like, oh, the whole purpose of this is about improving, not winning. Personal meaning, like why does this matter to you? What's the motivation behind doing this in the first place? And then the emotions that go through as you recall past events and plan future events, such as elation and adrenaline. One other, so besides the MRIs being the same when this jumper is both remembering past experiences and planning future experiences, um, there's also been some cognitive studies about amnesiac patients and patients who have difficulty remembering the past also have difficulty picturing the future, which I think is really fascinating. Um, there are some differences in the MRIs in addition to the temporal orientation of past versus future. Um, retrospective memory, or remembering the past, tends to be more vivid and detailed, whereas prospective memory, or remembering the future, often combines known ideas in new ways. And then from one of my, um, from my storytelling um, presentation this past spring at STC Summit, um, I also found research, and they did MRIs of people who were sharing the stories. So if we were talking to this jumper and listening to his story, as he was telling his story, our brains would start to light up in the same areas as his brain. And what they did is in the study, they had somebody watch an episode of like Walking Dead. And so as they start, so let's say you had three people watching the same episode. Those three people's brains would start to sync up. Their brain waves would, would be different before the show. And then as they're watching the show, the three brain waves would start to come into alignment. And even more interestingly is that they turned off the TV show and then they had somebody who watched the TV show recount the details of the episode to somebody else just in conversation. And when they were talking in conversation and sharing the story, their brain waves also started to align. And so that's why, or that's one of the things that is causing me to just realize how powerful storytelling is, is because we're literally aligning our brain waves with each other. And it's a very bonding experience and it builds connection. Um, I think understanding this overlap between memory of the past and anticipating the future is something that we as instructional designers and content creators, technical communicators as a whole, we kind of get this whether we didn't realize we got this or not. We understand that understanding past actions really help you predict future actions, um, especially like for me in the engineering world. Even if I wasn't aware that's what I was doing, that's kind of what I was doing. So there's, um, when we are using memories of the past to predict the future, it's not just enough to have the memory. As instructional designers, as content creators, that we hope that the people who are consuming our content change behavior. And there are three types of behavior that we are hoping to change. So the first is reflexive. So reflexive behavior is your subconscious, your stimulus reward. Um, and you can train stimulus reward. Um, it's also kind of the thing that you notice the least. 
we also have habitual behavior, which is our routines. And it's not just, you know, our routines at home, but also when we come to work or how we how we plan and execute a meeting. So we go into the meeting and, you know, as a culture, a group can establish their own habits and their own routines. The third type of behavior is goal-oriented behavior. And this is when people are willing to change their minds in light of new information if the reward is great enough because our brains are constantly seeking rewards. Sometimes these three types of memory work together. Sometimes they compete against each other. So to be on people's minds or to change their behavior, you must affect their reflexes, habits, or add values to their goals, or more than one. And you want to be careful not to overestimate the power, or sorry, underestimate the power of the reflexive or habitual behavior, especially when you're trying to introduce change. Um, it's the same principle whether you're setting a New Year's resolution or trying to institute a new program at work. So everybody starts out jazzed at first, like, yeah, I'm going to eat healthy and lose weight. You know, that's a typical one that many people uh, talk about doing at the beginning of a new year. But after a while, old habits and reflexes and routines kick in. The same thing can be in an office setting where you have this new program and everybody's really excited because it's going to make you more efficient, it's going to bring more value to the company, it's going to increase sales, whatever. And everybody is really excited about it, but then after a while, the old habits, the old routines, the old reflexes kind of become more powerful and they drag down on that initial energy. And so you might start a new program at work, but then after a while it fizzes out. And as trainers and technical communicators, when we're creating um, content or, or we're training somebody in something new, um, we're trying to change their behaviors. And sometimes we're trying to create a new behavior, like, hey, you just bought our brand new software and you've never had this software before, so now we have this opportunity to create some new habits. Um, but those new habits that you're creating aren't completely being created in a vacuum. Like, they're still old habits and old routines that you're replacing, and you're going to need to um, figure out a way to help people transition and make, make it easy enough to do the new habits and to do the new ways. Oftentimes, the easiest way to do that is to piggyback on top of their old habits. So, um, for instance, if somebody is having trouble smoking, like instead of you know trying to not put anything in your mouth at all, they're like, oh, chew a piece of gum because that way you're still having that habit of your hand in your mouth, um, the association between it, but you're not. Um, you're not using the nicotine. Sorry, I was just glancing at the chat. Okay. Yeah, we're good. Yeah, thank you so much. <clears throat> All right, so just to kind of, you know, pause, we're um, most of the way through, or like, just over half of the way through. Um, so why memory is important. So just to pause, the brain is a predictive engine. And as a predictive engine, it's fueled by memory. We look to the future to extract value for our present actions. So we, we take the experiences from the past, we use them to predict the future. I'm not sure if I wrote that right. I need to double check. <laughs> I'm looking at that I'm like, wait, that made sense when I wrote it. And it made sense when I rehearsed it. But now that I'm on a recording, I'm like, ah. Um, what I'm trying to say is that we take our past experiences. We're like, OK, I know that if I go on I-5 through Seattle at 6.30 in the morning, 
it's going to be bumper to bumper. So maybe I'm going to try to take 405 or I'm going to try to take Highway 9. So I have all these past experiences and these past experiences have caused me to create predictions that I make about the future which and I, I take my values for the future, my experiences from the past, and use those to make my decisions in the present. I hope that makes sense. Um, so how does that, and so that's, that's kind of like the theoretical stuff, and I really want to try to um, have some practical application as well. So this is where I'd like to start talking about when we share content, oftentimes our trainings, we're sharing content with audiences now for them to remember and act upon later. And in and I'm only sharing like portions of the first three chapters. Like there's so much I'm reading out or so much I'm leaving out. This is a really great book. I would really uh, recommend if you have time to read that you would read this book. Um, so this was a term that she used, and I really love this term. We are a choreographer of delayed intentions. And what that means is everybody intends to do things. You might say, call me at 2 o'clock, or get milk on the store, from the store on the way home. Finish my, okay, so I just finished in a meeting, and I took some notes, and I have some action items. I intend to finish my action items before the next meetings. Sometimes we follow through with those intentions. Sometimes we forget, like you get home and you're like, oh, I forgot to get milk. And sometimes we make value judgments when we prioritize or replace one intention over with another. So we might say, okay, I have these three things that I intend to do, and this is the you know, number one is the most important, number two is the next important, and number three I may or may not get to. Or we may have a high intention to do those action items before the next meeting, and then something else comes in that's higher priority and replaces your intention with another intention. As instructional designers and technical writers and just generally content creators, we are choreographers of delayed intentions. We set the stage for the future. We build memories now in anticipation of actions not yet taken. We give, so by, by giving instructions, it's kind of like telling the stories. And when you tell a story, um, oh yeah, this is something else I also learned from my last, um, from my last presentation is that if you are to hear a story, read a story, watch a story of somebody running, in your brain, the same areas of your brain light up for running, even though your legs aren't actually moving. And it's a really good thing that we can learn from stories, because that way we don't have to make all the mistakes all by ourselves, although often we do. But um, by stories, by instructions, by learning, by training, we are able to kind of build those memories, pre-build those memories ahead of time. But it's not just enough to build those memories. There's three steps that we have to take in order to influence people to both remember their future intentions and act successfully. So. Here we have a timeline. We share content here at this point in time. So this is where the training happens. This is where people are in the classroom. This is where the manual is being read. At some future point in time, the user has to remember the information and act upon it. When they remember and act upon information, there are three actions that happen sometimes in very, like, you know, within milliseconds. But they have to notice the cues, search their memory for what those cues mean, and then decide whether or not they're going to execute on that intention if the intention is rewarding enough. For example, um, at least in Seattle, we are really big on using cloth bags. 
when you go to the grocery store. Um, and I am horrible about remembering my cloth bags. And what's really nice is that some stores have put up signs above the um, the cart return area in the parking lot saying, did you remember your bags? So that would be the, the cue. So I first I have to notice the sign, did you remember your bags? The second thing is I have to remember what the cue means. And in this case, that's pretty automatic because the words are pretty explicit. Did you remember your bags? And then finally, I have to decide if the value of remembering my bags outweighs the time or steps it takes to go back and get the bags. Maybe it does, maybe it doesn't. Maybe I'm like, oh, I need the extra steps, or maybe it's raining, and I don't feel like going back and getting them, or cold. Um, another thing that I didn't realize, you know, when I said before about sometimes we do this and we didn't realize we were actually doing this. Another thing that I've been known to do is if I go to a party at a friend's house, um, especially if it's a potluck, I've been known to put my car keys in the refrigerator along with the food I want to remember to take home with me. Or sometimes I'll put my car keys with my dish that I want to remember to take home with me. At some point, I will want to get in my car and I'll look for my keys. And wow. the missing keys will be the cue that, because I can't go anywhere without my keys. And so I'm like, oh no, where are my keys? You know, that brief panicky moment. And then hopefully I have a good enough memory that I'll be like, that's right. I put my keys along with my dish so that I would remember my dish. And so now the, the next part is, you know, trying to remember where I put my dish. Like, oh, did I put it in the back bedroom or did it, go on the kitchen counter and then, oh no, somebody else moved my keys and my dish. So like that's kind of separate problems. But the second step is, so the first step was noticing that my keys were missing. That was my cue. And then searching my memory for what that cue means. My car keys are missing. What does that mean? That means that I want to remember to bring my food home. And then three is deciding whether or not I want to execute. Now, because I really want to go home, I will execute on searching and hunting down my dish and my keys because I want to go home. Um, but not only that, the other reward is that I get the food that I wanted to take home, assuming I wanted to take it home and not just leave it at somebody's house um, for them to eat or take to the office or getting my serving dish back. I don't have to go to the hassle of remembering my serving dish from my friend's house. So again, cue, search your memory, what does that cue mean, and then decide whether or not to act upon that. And if the reward is, is good enough or not. So the same thing happens when we are doing training. And I'd like you for a moment to consider your own content and imagine you're helping your audience through this process. What are you doing when you share content to prime your users for cues when it's time to act? Associate a memory of what to do with that cue and provide a reward valuable enough to get the action that's needed at the time that it's needed. So while you think about that, because um, I love to find studies, because it, it just, you know, it's, it's one thing to have an opinion, and it's another thing to research and prove it. Um, so there is, and some studies aren't really studies, they're just anecdotal stories, um, but some studies are actually like rigorously conducted studies. So this is a little bit of a, it's not necessarily peer replicated, but, um, I think it illustrates the point well enough. So there was a study that asked two groups of university students to write a simple one-page essay over winter holiday break on something memorable that happened. If they did, they would earn a small sum of money, $10. In the first group, they agreed verbally that they would write that one-page essay on something memorable, and then they signed a piece of paper. The second group not only agreed, but the researcher asked the student to verbalize 
a plan with details about when, where, how, etc. that they were going to write that one page essay. So for instance, I'm going to sit at my desk the day after Christmas and write a, a few paragraphs on what presents I got and what they mean to me. Or um, we're going to travel to family and then on the way home while I'm in the airport waiting for the airplane or you know whatever or while I'm in the car I'm just going to you know make sure I have my notebook of paper and I'm going to write out um, by hand a, a one-page essay about my trip. And you probably have guessed the first group that just agreed that they were going to do it, they had a modest success rate. But the second group was almost entirely, like it was almost a 100% success rate. It was like 80 or 90%. By thinking and verbalizing a plan, they created cues and a future memory of what to do when those cues happened. So you know, you open your presents on Christmas Day and the next day you're looking at your presents and you had verbally created the story in your head. Oh yeah, that's right, I was going to write that essay. Or you're sitting in the airport or you're writing in the car or you see that notebook. You're like, oh yeah, I was going to write that essay. So they, they created cues, a future memory of what to do when those cues happened, and then they hopefully were motivated both by the small monetary reward, but also as humans, one of the things that we really like to be creatures of, we, we like to follow through on our word. If we say we're going to do something, we like to do it. Um, so for me at work, yeah, and feel free to type, and then after I share stories, also at the end we can also uh, stop the recording and you know, have some discussion if you don't want your voice recorded and we don't want to share our, <laughs> record our stories for posterity on YouTube. Um, but for me at work, some of the things that I've been considering is when I uh, give training, most of the trainings I work with so far, like I was kind of doing a review of, of new customer onboarding training and a lot of it opens with the standard objectives. At the end of this lesson, you will be able to blah, blah, blah. Um, now what I've been trying to do is I've been trying to go through my trainings and phrase it more in terms of cue response. When you encounter ABC, you'll know how to do XYZ. And by phrasing it that way, I'm thinking, and I don't have any like scientific proof on how well it works or not yet. Um, these are just things that I'm doing, and the preliminary feedback has been good, um, but what I'm doing is I'm creating these cues. So I'm giving training at point A, and then at point B, they're going to be like, oh yeah, I experienced situation ABC, and now I know how to do XYZ. So they're searching the memory for the cues, and hopefully they'll execute on the intention because it will provide them rewards of saved headaches and aggravation and wasted time. Um, also, when you're creating training, screenshots can be really great cues because they're very concrete and explicit representation of the cue, what you're looking for. So when you see this screenshot, when you see this warning, when you see this button, this is what you're supposed to do with that button, with that warning. Um, and then when it comes to adopting new processes or hardware, change management, it's changing behavior is definitely much harder. Um, what I like to do is try to start with small wins because, and these are very big generalizations, most people in most situations like to change gradually rather than have a drastic overhaul. So if I can first ask questions and analyze what the existing habits and the existing goals are, and then just change one small thing at a time that they can win at almost instantly, like, oh, so we have, let's say I have a very complicated piece of software, and the user is like, oh my gosh, how am I ever going to learn how to be a database or terminology administrator for this? And so instead, 
of saying, oh, well, you have to learn this huge pile of information, start with one simple thing that they can do first. Um, and hopefully if I've done my homework, I can say, hey, you know, I'm looking at your, your content on your company's website, and I notice you have your company name. Um, one example would be PayPal. Is it PayPal with two capital P's? Is it all one word? Is it two words? And so I can say, hey, you know, you're doing terminology training. Let's take a look at your company name. And is it, you know, I've noticed some variations on your company name. Maybe we could create a use, don't use list for how to do your company name. Bam. Easy. I know how to do that. Okay, well then now that we've done a use, don't use for your company name, what are some other terms you might think of? And so just kind of slowly change the behavior and habits and then create cues like, oh, I'm seeing this term and then search the memory. I've got my use, don't use list and then execute the intention. So those are things that I am doing at work and hopefully are providing you with maybe some ideas, some very concrete, specific ideas that you can adopt in your work. And I'll just, oh yeah. And this is, so Jamie says, this is where prior experience and content chunking really comes into play here to help create those cues to drive actions. Yes, exactly. Yay. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and just finish up and then with a little meta summary of my presentation and then give the thank you. And then with the remaining time, we can stop the recording and just have an informal discussion. Great. So for, yay. So for my meta summary, um, do in this presentation, have I created a cue memory response? And this is a squishy yes. Um, I don't really have any hard objectives that I can measure. Like, are you able to institute cue memory response in your training? Well, I'm not going to go measure that. I'm not going to assess it. And my whole purpose today is to take this idea that really inspired me over this past summer and share it with you and hopefully inspire and raise, raise awareness with you. So um, hopefully I've given you some cues in your work situation. I tried to keep them generic enough that you could identify with them and associate yourself with them um, and maybe giving yourself some ideas in which you could maybe write some training that might be a little bit better and more effective. Um, so in this presentation, am I changing reflex, habit, or goal-oriented goal behavior? And the answer is, again, squishy. It depends. Um, there isn't really a large reason to change from this one experience unless it overlaps or enhances a goal or habit you already have. So if you're attending this presentation, chances are you're kind of interested in what, what the content subject may be about, which means that you might be open to the idea and have the goal-oriented behavior of maybe enhancing training or using memory techniques to enhance your training. And so what I've shared with you today might piggyback on a goal that you already had. But if you're not going to change, you're not going to change. And that's okay, too. Um, and what memories am I leaving you with? So you're going to, you know, we've had this experience together in this past, you know, almost hour. Um, so I hope that I've left you with some story full pictures, um, some very concrete examples, and a timeline. So, you know, when you think back tomorrow, next week, a year later, um, oh yeah, I was at that webinar. And what do I remember from that webinar? Um, so when I was training to be a teacher, we would call this the key understanding. So that was like the center of the bullseye. And then at, outside of the center of the bullseye, you had things to know and do, and then, you know, nice to have. And so the key understanding that I hope you leave with today is 
thinking about how memory fuels predictive action. And when you're creating content that's read at time point A, but then acted upon at time point B, you take that into consideration as you create your content. And that's my thank you. And if you want to email me or something occurs to you at a later point, you please feel free to contact me via LinkedIn or my email, my Twitter handle, or my website. I don't have an email list or anything set up yet, but that's on my list to do before winter break. I will have my website better set up and rearranged. So let's go ahead and stop the recording. Okay, and thank okay. you so much for all your time. Well, first let's applaud. Applaud into my mic. Okay, now I'll stop the recording.